Let's look at the reflection and transmission of waves as they hit boundaries and change media. First thing I'm going to do is send in a single pulse into a fixed barrier, meaning the end of this string, is, this last bead here, is going to be held in a fixed position. So if I send in the pulse, I'm going to slow it down and, and start to step it as we get close to the barrier. This red bead here is pulling up on the green bead but the green bead is held fixed and that means it's going to exert a reaction force on the red beads and that means there's generally going to be a force pushing downwards on these beads here as a reaction force so let's see what happens now so you can see the downward force now starting to swing the beads to the other side and then it starts heading off as a regular pulse. So we get an inversion when we have a fixed barrier. The pulse becomes inverted on the way back. Let's look at what happens when we switch to a loose end. So this time there's a ring on a rod, so this green bead is going to be able to go upwards as the pulse comes in. So let's see what happens. And I'll slow it down. The uh, green bead, now it can go up due to that upward force. Notice that it goes way up. It goes a long ways up and then it starts pushing the pulse forward and we get a regular size for pulse on the way back. Uh, we can kind of understand, now that we understand superposition, why this goes up so high because you've got an incident pulse coming in that's upwards. That's your incident pulse. And then there's a reflected pulse coming backwards it's also upwards and the two add up and so you get a kind of a double amplitude for an instant there at the free end of the rope and then it comes back but on the same side. So we can summarize that if we've got a fixed barrier and often we draw that as a kind of a wall so we've got a pulse coming in this way so when it reflects backwards it's going to come back on the other side. There is a, a 180 degree phase change or an inversion when you have a fixed barrier. When we had the free barrier, and I'll let, represent a free barrier's dotted lines here, so our pulse came in, it was, had an upwards on the upward side, and it came back on the same side. So there's no phase change when there is a reflection from a free barrier. So let's consider what happens when uh, we have a pulse sent in from a light spring, from a lighter medium to a heavier medium. A couple things to notice. One thing is we do get the inversion. We do get the 180 degree phase change, also called an inversion. And the second thing is, and maybe it's not showing so well here, but there's a, a good portion of that incident wave gets reflected back. Well, good portion of incident wave is reflected back. And generally, not so much gets transmitted through to the second spring. And we can understand that the second spring here, it's heavier, it's got more inertia, so it doesn't move so much. And it's the lighter spring that does more of the moving, and that makes it do the phase change. If we go in the opposite direction, we send the pulse from a heavy spring to a light spring, then we get, on reflection, no phase inversion. And we also get not so much reflection this time. Not so much of the wave gets reflected. A lot of the wave gets transmitted. So I'd say more of the wave is transmitted. Okay, not too much that can happen in a one-dimensional situation. There's more that goes on when we look at 2D and 3D waves, but we just want to go over a few conventions for drawing 2D and 3D waves. So here, here's a representation of a water wave, and if I draw a line along one of the crests of the water waves, then that line becomes what's called a wave front. And we can imagine the crests are moving in this direction here 
and they would always move in a direction that's perpendicular to the wave front. This arrow here that tells you what direction the wave moves is called the wave ray. And of course we would have lots of these crests or of these wave fronts and the distance between them would have to be a wavelength. So your schematic diagram would look more like this here and we'd have a wave ray right there always perpendicular to the wave fronts. That would be a front. And the distance between the the crests or the fronts would be the wavelength. So we've got a changing wavelength in this situation. The wavelength is shorter here than here. Now, okay, so let's take these uh, two-dimensional drawings a little farther. Right now we've got a diagram here of uh, some water waves and on one side this might be some deep water, so this, these would be, this would be some fast moving waves over on this side. And on the other side, some shallower water where the waves move more slowly. So once again, we have a, a ray coming in, the perpendicular to the wave fronts. This would be called the incident ray. Some of that wave would reflect off the boundary and it would go off in about that direction and of course there would be wave uh, there would be wave fronts I'm not going to draw them all but there would be wave fronts perpendicular to that ray this would be called the reflected ray and then we'd have to define a line here it's called the normal and we can have it on both sides here but it's a line that's perpendicular to the boundary between the media. And you draw it wherever the incident ray comes in and hits the boundary. And we can draw a normal at that point. But that allows us to define a couple angles. First angle that we're going to define is called the angle of incidence. I'm going to use an I for the angle of incidence. But you always measure the angle I from the normal to the ray, never from the boundary to the right. It's always from the normal. On the other side, I'll call this R prime, that'll be the angle of reflection. So that I can write, this is actually the law of reflection. Let me write it over here. The law of reflection. It simply says that whatever that angle I is, it's going to be the, exactly the same as the angle R prime. In other words, the angle of incidence must equal the angle of reflection. Now we can also draw a refracted ray or transmitted ray. It of course is going to be perpendicular to these wave fronts on the other side. And that allows us to define another angle. I'll call it R. That would be the angle of refraction. And once again it's measured from the normal to the ray. This is the refracted ray or the transmitted ray if you prefer. Of course it's going to be perpendicular to all of those wave fronts in that medium. So here's a, I've taken all the wave fronts off to clarify things but we've got as a summary we've got an angle of incidence here that's equal to this angle of reflection and then we've got another angle here called the angle of refraction. And in this particular case we're moving from air into glass. The air would be the fast medium. This would be a light ray and the glass would be the slow medium. And generally when it's light we don't draw the, the wave fronts because light is easily thought of as being a ray. If I send in a, if I have a laser here and I send in a laser beam, you'll, you'll see, see this pattern exactly. You'll see the red laser light take this path. Some of it reflects and goes this way and some of it transmits and refracts that way. We were just saying how when light travels from a fast medium, say air, into a slow medium, say glass, that the incident ray it does not continue on its straight line path. It bends towards the normal. Now 
in the case of light, there's a very nice way to explain that, a very nice analogy at least. Light, it always takes the least time to get from point A to point B. Now, we can kind of make a comparison between light and a lifeguard trying to save a dis person in distress. Because they're, they can move a lot faster on the sand when they're running compared to the water when they're swimming, they should take a path somewhat like this so that they're covering more of the distance on the sand, a greater percentage of the total distance on the sand. And if that's the case, then of course they're bending towards the normal. Now, in a general case, even when it's not light, you can use this axis analogy to remember which way the light's going to bend. Once again, we're going from a fast medium where the axis will roll very quickly on the sidewalk into a slow medium, which is the grass. Now, if that's the case, this wheel here, it's going to hit first. And this wheel here is going to continue at a higher speed. And that's going to cause some rotation of the axis, and the axis will once again, bend towards that normal line. So, in summary, when going from fast to slow, waves bend towards the normal. When going from slow to fast, it's going to be the opposite, and the waves will bend away from the normal. This phenomena of refraction is responsible for a lot of uh, familiar phenomena, such as on a hot day and you're driving down the highway, you might see what seems to be puddles in front of you, but when you actually get closer, you realize it's not puddles. That's actually due to refraction. That's because light travels more quickly in hot air than it does in cool air. So if we can imagine the light coming in this way, then we can, it, it's a gradual boundary, but we can kind of imagine an, a boundary at this point between the cool and the fast, and the light, of course, would bend, it's going into the faster medium, so it bends away from the normal. But of course, it's a gradual process, so it just kind of keeps turning and turning and turning, getting closer and closer to going horizontally, and then it reflects and comes back. Now, if you're on your motorcycle here, and light from, say, a cloud travels this path, the way your brain reconstructs that, of course, it's just light hitting the back of your retina, and your brain has to reconstruct an image. What it does, basically, is it always assumes that that light came in a straight line. So what it actually sees, it kind of creates an image over here. And so you get an image formed of the clouds, but it's kind of beneath the road and that gives the shimmering effect to the road itself. Turns out desert mirages can be explained in the same way. Uh, refraction is a very common uh, phenomenon. As a summary for this lesson, uh, first thing we learned was that uh, in 1D, we had 1D reflection. If you've got a fixed barrier, then you get the 180 degree phase change or the inversion. If you've got a free barrier, there's no inversion. And then we learned how to do these two-dimensional diagrams. We could have wave fronts, wave ray, a normal, a refracted ray, incident ray, reflected ray, angle of incidence, angle of reflection, and angle of refraction. And we learned that if we're going from a fast to a slow medium, the refracted ray bends towards the normal. And that's all for today, folks. Thank you very much.